So what I'm showing right now is the method editor that you might see on either the Orbitrap Eclipse IQX or the Orbitrap Ascend. Um, the instrument control software between them is pretty standardized. So this is Tune 4.0 point, you know, some sub flavor, but it's the Thermos standard release of 4.0. Um, though my method editor reads Orbitrap Ascend, it should be identical for the Eclipse or the IQX. So if you have those method editors installed, those workstations installed, feel free to kind of follow along and ask questions, otherwise chime in. Um, so there's a couple of different things that you need to start off uh, considering when you're setting up a method from scratch. So there's three basically main tabs in the method editor. Um, there's these global parameters and it's global parameters are something that's set across your entire experiment. There's scan parameters that are specific for basically um, a subset of your experiment. Your experiment, So basically it corresponds to this blue bar here. You can have multiple bars. And then there's kind of this summary. Um, one thing I want to note is there's no LC attached to this. That's controlled with a different piece of software. So I'm going to kind of ignore all the chromatography stuff for now and just focus on the mass spec. Um, Cause that can change depending on what LC setup you have. Okay. So the first thing that I like to start out with usually is setting um, the application mode uh, in the method editor. So there's three different settings on the tribrids. There's peptide mode, small molecule mode, and intact protein. And when you change these settings, um, what you can see on the right here is some of these uh, basically options change. So um, when you set peptide mode, um, you lose a category. I didn't see which one you lose. So you lose this kind of mild trapping option um, some other things that change when you change your application mode, there are kind of global settings that you can't see here, like um, what intensity threshold do you set like isotopic distribution uh, cutoffs for, for your calculations and the instruments acquiring data and it's assigning monoisotopes and stuff. Like depending on what application mode you have set, those change. So um, if you want to do real-time library search, or um, run on a tribrid and do lipidomics, I would suggest running in small molecule mode. Um, there might be reasons why you want to run in peptide mode, um, but if you're just doing lipidomics, it's just small, small molecule mode. Um, you also want to change your method duration to how long you actually want your LC analysis time to go. So we typically do 60 minutes, um, or we've been doing 60 minutes for our real-time library search work that I talked about previously. Um, for our expected LC peak widths on the right in settings, I usually set it to about 10 seconds. Um, we always want to use advanced peak determination. It basically allows the instrument to better deconvolute co-isolated species at the MS1 level so you can properly assi assign monoisotopes. And this helps you isolate the correct um, precursors. And it also helps you get more accurate results when you're doing data processing as Oftentimes, when you're searching your data post acquisition, um, search algorithms will use the monoisotope, the isolated precursor, or the calculated monoisotope as your precursor M over Z for your MS2s. And if that's wrong, it can throw off your results. Um, I, up to this point, have left mild trapping off. Um, and then default charge state for lipids, I leave at one. Um, as most lipid species tend to be singly charged. Um, the instrument does a pretty good job of calculating multiply charged um, species, but if it was unable to calculate a charge state for a particular, a particular peak, it'll assign it one by default. And we don't run with acquire X um, yet. It's something that we need to explore and we don't use internal mass calibration. Um, Give me one second. I have some settings set up. So for our ion source type, um, we usually use nanospray ionization. So we'd use NSI. But this, again, depends on your LC setup. If you're using standard flow, you might want the HESI source or the electrospray ionization. It depends. Um, positive ion mode. Um, I'm trying to remember. You can we use like 1350. Does that sound right? I'm trying uh, to remember. I think we. I think we 
We typically use 2000 for 2000. Email. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 2000. It's one of those small details that flash out of my brain. I have all the scan parameters memorized, just the global settings change. Um, and then typically, uh, we leave the uh, sweep gas at default, the iron transfer too. I think we leave at 275. Um, one thing to keep in mind is depending on what you set your ion transfer tube at, it can impact the amount of in-source fragmentation that you have. So the hotter you have that transfer capillary set, um, tends to tends to desolvate more, and it can impact your uh, precursor, your intensities as you're, um, you know, scanning out. But it also can induce more in-source fragmentation. So something to just keep in mind. So that's kind of. Uh, the things that we use for a typical lipidomics run, regardless of you know ionization polarity, um, these are kind of our default settings. Next, um, I'm gonna move on to scan parameters here. So this is where you kind of get in the nitty gritty um, on how the instrument's actually acquiring spectra. So for our data dependent acquisition uh, experiments, typically what you do is you'd go over here, basically uh, the on the left and on the experiment tab here, these are all the different options you get to use. And you'll see some similarities in the slides that I showed previously and kind of the decision tree. Um, I tried to mimic it as close as I could without being overly convoluted. But um, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do in most experiments uh, is do a you know, precursor scan or a, you know, MS1. And on the tribrids, we always do those in the Orbitrap. Um, typically, what I like to collect with for a resolution is at 2400. Um, I've seen people use 12, uh, 120K resolution as well. That's 240K, not 2400. What am I talking about? Um, mass range that I use is normal. Um, lipids are typically between anywhere between 200 to 1600 M over Z, unless you're looking at larger lipid species that can go bigger. Um, but for a typical, just, you know, taking a look at human plasma or something, uh, 200 to 1600 is usually what we would, um, hover at. So that's what I would set this to 200 to 1600 for our scan range mass to charge. Um, we use quadruple isolation, um, just to filter out heavier ions, um, we leave our RF lens at 30%. For our AGC target, we usually set it to custom, and then we move the AGC target up relatively high, and then we set the maximum inject time to, I believe, 50 milliseconds. So kind of the goal is um, when you're doing precursor scans, you almost always have a ton of ions coming out at any point in time. So what we want is to jam as many ions into the orbit trap for the MS-1 as we can in as short of a period of time as we can. We don't want, the longer you sit there and you accumulate ions, the slower you scan, the less precursors you end up sampling across your experiment. So we found kind of the sweet spot um, to be 50 milliseconds. And the reason why we jack up the AGC target to 250% is so we always are maxing out that inject time instead of hitting our AGC target instead, which is automated gain control for those of you that are unfamiliar with what AGC stands for. But it's a way that you can normalize intensity uh, as you're scanning. Um, uh, then I think yeah. so for MS1, because the um, the intensity is just like it's really, really high. Mm -hmm. And even you set the max injection time to 50, the, the actual injection time could be probably just a few milliseconds for MS, mm -hmm. uh, at MS1 level. Yeah, that's usually what we see. But just in case, you know, at the beginning or end of your gradient or if things are sparse this way, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for micro scans, um, we typically leave that at one. We only want to collect one MS1. Um, we don't need those replicates for micro scans. We don't need averaging, special averaging for the most part. Um, for a standard DDA methodology, we usually leave our data and profile mode. So you basically have you would have that Gaussian peak shape for your MS ones. Um, and then if you really are concerned about your raw files getting too big, you can collect in centroid. But um, I always like to think that more information is better, and leaving the data and profile mode is preferred. Um, Virginia, you have a question. 
Uh, yeah, I have one question about your resolution versus <laughs> your maximum injection time. So I'm a little confused as to why you guys are using such a high resolution. <laughs> Basically, um, this comes down to paralyzability of the orbit trap and the ion traps and the tribrid. So one thing that uh, I'll guess I'll just drag this over right now to um, let's see if I can. Well, let me do it yet. Um, basically, uh, we set our cycle time to one second um, when we're acquiring MS2. So basically, you acquire an MS1, and then the instrument will sample as many things as it can over that one second. What ends up happening is you have a 240k MS1. Um, the transient time is about a second. Um, so basically you're always keeping the orbit trap occupied while you're um, scanning out, collecting as many MS2s as you can. And that one second kind of interval is a nice balance where you can continually get a nice peak profile. So your quant is nice, you get good quant, but you can also get uh, deeper into the, you know, sampling more precursors because you're spending more time collecting MS2s. You could collect shorter MS1s if you wanted. Um, but then the if you had a one second cycle time, the orbit trap would basically be sitting there idle. Um, so it's just more resolving power, you know. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, and there's something I would like to add yes. uh, on this one. So if you really would like to have some high res MS2 data, so like use, also using orbit trap to collect your MS2, you probably wouldn't want your MS1 resolution to be like super high. Uh, otherwise, you will just it, it will take really like about five hundred mil uh second to finish your MS1 uh acquisition. So if you are doing a uh, orbit trip for your MS2, um, you probably would uh like your orbit trip, uh, sorry MS1 resolution to be only sixty thousand or one hundred twenty thousand. Gotcha. That's Thank expected. you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for chiming in with that, Yi Chen. I had uh, I did not mention that. Um, all right. So give me one second. I am looking up. I have screen caps of all this stuff. Yeah, it I seems we got another question uh, from Hai Yin. Yeah. Do you mind feeling uh, that? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, find this one. So my my question is, uh, what's the difference between mass range and the scan range here? In the right of the screen, you have mass range as normal and you have scan range what's the difference between these two parameters yes so mass range basically um uh here i can hover over it so the nice thing about this method editor is you can hover over these settings and it'll give you more additional information so um basically um high mass range if you change your setting for mass range to high mass you can't scan as low as you would usually. Basically, it changes electronics so that you can preferentially. I don't know what the limits are for high mass. Um, I've never used it myself, but basically, you wouldn't. It's more for intact proteins, or you know, middle oh, okay. down or top down analyses, um, where you have you know multiple kilodalton um, precursors. That, mean, that means you use normal range, and still you can select the give the definition or the scan range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, exactly. Great. Got you. Thank you. Okay, I need to find, where did I put this? Okay, I think this is where I put it. DMB. Here we go, all right. So for a, okay, you have to drag some filters over. So the first thing I typically drag over is this precursor selection range. So what the instrument is basically doing is you acquire an MS1, and then that that special data from that MS1 needs to pass through a series of filters before it's, anything is isolated for an MS2. So in this particular case, there's a precursor selection range. Typically, I match this to what I specify in the um, MS1 scan properties. You know, if you're scanning out 200 to 1600, you might as well sample the things that are 200 or 1600. 
Um, it can depend. Um, there's a lot of contaminants below 300 m over Z. Uh, so it depends on your sample prep and exactly what you're seeing and your tolerance for you know, your search tolerances. But um, typically, I like to leave the precursor selection range similar to uh, what I'm scanning out in the Orbitrat for uh, survey scans. The next thing I drag over is this MIPS node, and it stands for monoisotope precursor selection. Uh, and basically, this is a heuristic algorithm for how, you know, if you have an isotopic distribution, what factors are weighted to detect monoisotopes? So, you know, peptides, for example, if you're doing body proteomics, have a different isotopic distribution than lipids. Um, so if you use peptide mode for the monoisotopic peak determination, uh, you might not always get the right monoisotope assigned. So you almost always, if you're running in small molecule mode, you want to set the monoisotopic peak determination to small molecule mode as well. And it just allows you to pick out the monoisotope more reliably. Um, the next thing I like to move over is, it's always drag it over to the wrong section. Where are you? I'm going to drag over an MS2. So you can take this MSN node and drag it over, place it there. Um, I'm going to leave it there for now. I'm going to keep on dragging over more filters. So I'm going to drag over the intensity filter and drop it in. So the intensity filter is basically the minimum intensity that you want to allow uh, for sampling a uh, precursor. So um, for if you're doing ion trap MS2s, I'll typically set this to um, I believe it's 4.5 E3. I'm gonna double check that because I actually had this screen capped. Um, where are you? 4 E3, 4.0 E3. As the ion trap is more sensitive than the orbit trap, you can sample lower abundance things. Um, if you are running orbit trap scans, you'll probably want to move your or a trap MS2s, you'll want to bump that intensity threshold up to probably one or two E4, just because you need more ions to reliably get good spectra in the orbit trap for MS2s. All right. So the next thing I drag over is going to be dynamic exclusion. So dynamic exclusion is something that you use so you don't consistently sample the same precursor over and over and over again. So you know between one MS1 and the second one, the same precursors are likely to be relatively still the most intense. So this is a way that you can you know sample one thing and then ignore it for a set amount of time. So um, usually what I set uh, everything to is uh, I want to exclude after I sampled one time if you are, you know, if you want to sample the same precursor multiple times, you can raise that number. We like to leave it at one um, just to get deeper into the lipidome at any point in time. Our exclusion duration, uh, you typically I'll sit, set it to um, our expected peak width, which is 10 seconds or so. So, you know, you sample one precursor and then you wait 10 seconds. And then if it's still there, you sample it again. Uh, but hopefully our chromatography is good enough that it is now a different species if you see it again. And then for a mass tolerance, we'll almost always want to use PPM if you're using the, <laughs> hopefully on the tribrid, you're collecting high resolution MS1s. Uh, and then we'll usually leave the tolerances at 10, uh, plus or minus 10, but you can change those depending on mass calibration, you know, whatever you're feeling. Um, but I think 10 personally is a sweet spot. I like excluding isotopes. Um, this prevents uh, if there's some you know weird behaviors with peak determination and like isotopic distribution assignment, you won't sample you know a plus you know one or a plus two isotope of the same species. Um, if you're using MIPS, the setting has to be checked. So it's you know I guess not really an option for what I'm showing you here. Um, and then I typically leave perform dependent scan on a single charge state per precursor only. I leave that off because most lipid species are singly charged. So it's not really something that we need to consider. Um, some species in negative mode and positive mode, especially larger lipids can be multiply charged, but um, we typically don't, we'll search for them, but we typically don't worry about them too much because there's not, we don't see them all that frequently. They're there, but 
um, they don't overly impact. They're not as abundant as like glycerophospholipids or triacylglycerols. All right, finally, I can get to the MS2. <laughs> so a bunch of filters. Um, we get to the MS2. Um, and some of you might see that I have more options than you uh, here. Um, if you don't have all these options shown, you should click this kind of corner here. Um, it'll show you more things. So if it says show all, click this and it'll give you more stuff to look at. Um, so for ion trap analysis, uh, we'll usually, uh, if you're selecting a precursor, we'll do isolation with a quadrupole. You can, if you wanted to isolation with the ion trap, but it's not as fast as a quadrupole. So um, I would recommend always using the quadrupole to isolate. Uh, you can use different isolation windows. I believe the orbit trap ascend goes down to a low range of 0.4 Daltons or embers uh, for your isolation range at the smallest, or you can go wider. And there's kind of this trade-off that you play when you mess with the isolation window. So the narrower your isolation window is, um, the more confident you can be that you're going to have you're going to have less um, co-isolation of isobaric species or um, you know other lipid species, um, but it comes at a cost of sensitivity. So there's a little give and take there. Um, hi, Anne, I see that you have a question. I'm sorry, that's a mistake. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're totally fine. <laughs> um, yes, you Chen. <laughs> I did forget that. I'll add that in a second. Um, but what I've done for my analyses, typically, um, I'll use an isolation window of 0 0.7 uh, m over z. You can use a. You can. I've also seen people in the lab use um, an isolation window of one. Um, there's some small differences in your total number of IDs and the amount of co-isolation that you get. Um, we haven't system systematically tested if 0.7 is better than 0.1 on the Ascend yet. Um, just because the last time I collected data, I used 0.7. I'm going to leave 0.7 here. Um, we're not going to use an isolation offset. Uh, for our first kind of MS2, we'll typically use HCD activation because it's faster, especially on the Ascend, with it having a front end HCD cell. It's particularly quick. Um, you can alternatively use CID or depending on what your instrument configuration is set up with, you'll have different options. So, you know, uh, I would never recommend using ETD <laughs> on lipids. Um, you won't get any signal. You won't get fragmentation. Um, I'll typically use a normalized collision energy level of 27%. I know Yu Chen in the past has used stepped collision energy here, basically, um, there's two different ways that you can do collisional activation. You can either take all your precursor and then use a set collision energy and hit it all, basically all your precursors, uh, and that's fixed collision energy. You can do stepped collision energies where basically you take a third of your precursor, you activate it at one energy, you take another third, you activate it at the second energy, and then the final third, at the third energy. So it gives you a broader range of fragmentation um, and different kind of patterns. Um, so some species that would need a higher energy fragment better with stepped collision energy, but it's also a little slower. Um, again, it's not something that I've thoroughly tested, um, but I've gotten good enough results at a fixed collision energy of 27%. But again, you know, your results might vary. Um, for just to exploit the, uh, I am, now you have a question? <laughs> yes. So um, this setting is for untargeted, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is untargeted. Oh, OK. You didn't compare the fixed energy between the fixed energy and the step energy. Have you ever done that? Um, we've dabbled a little bit. I haven't oh. done anything. We've um, we because, previously used, yeah, please. Yeah, Sorry. because the, the lipid, uh, the 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 car the, there are different type of lipids, so I, I guess the the energy may not be different than needed, right? Mm -hmm. It means different energy, different category of lipids may need a different energy to have a better fragmentation. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of work to be done on like kind of the optimization yeah. of what 
the ideal ideal energies are. And this is something that you could actually do with like real time library search is you could, oh, okay. if you know the individual species and you really characterize each individual species, like a well, general trend that I know exists is larger lipids. So longer acyl chains need generally higher energies to fragment. Mm -hmm. 27 is kind of like a happy middle ground where you get good enough fragmentation that you can identify things from what okay. I've seen um, for fixed. Uh, okay. But there's no reason why you can't use stepped. Okay. You'll get very similar results either way. Great. I've just optimized for speed. Um, yes. Okay. So for the detector type on the tribrid, we typically use ion trap. If you need want high resolution, you desire high resolution MS2s, you can always change this to orbit trap. Totally fine. Just depends on your personal preference. Just one thing to keep in mind is you do break parallelization if you do high resolution MS2s. Um, so you would want to use uh, s smaller resolving power, uh, less resolving power on your uh, precursor scans. For mass range, we typically leave it at normal. And then for scan range mode, we set to auto. And then for our AGC targets, kind of similar to what we do with the MS1s, we, what I've been doing for my real-time library search work is I've been boosting up the AGC target. So I want to get as many ions into the ion trap as I can, and then I fragment them. And then I set the maximum injection time to 17 milliseconds, uh, just so that I can em like emphasize speed. Uh, and this way, you know, you scan quicker, you get as many ions as you can in that 17 milliseconds. So you're almost always, um, unless you have a, yeah, basically as many ions as you can, as fast as you can. And then for the ion trap data, we always collect in centroid. Um, peak picking algorithms, if you do want to centroid, if you do collect in profile with ion trap data, can behave a little funny. Um, but, you know, it depends on how sophisticated your peak picking algorithm is if you collect in profile. So your results may vary. And one thing that you Chen had pointed out that I'd forgotten as well is one thing that we do is a target and mass exclusion as well. Let's see if it actually lets me place it in here. There we go. So this is something that we add uh, to prevent ourselves from sampling. Um, there's certain contaminants that appear throughout the entire gradient during our hour analysis. So you think, you know, if you sample that contaminant every 10 seconds, uh, you can lose out on quite a lot of data and a lot of lipid identifications. So um, there is a set of um, contaminants that we've previously profiled um, that uh, basically we have a CSV uh, comma separate, like an Excel spreadsheet full of them and you can just import them. So we click at uh, import and we find that, where is it? I know it's here, target mass exclusion list. And we would just import it. And then basically these things would never be sampled, these particular mass of charges. And our list is quite long. Um, but basically, you know, we don't sample those mass charges and we set the, uh, exclusion mass similar to before to 10 PPM. This is just to prevent sampling things that would never convert to an actual identification. So that, that's basically like our positive mode analysis right here. Um, if you're just doing data dependent acquisition, um, I haven't touched on targeted. I haven't dabbled with targeted myself. Um, I don't know if you have, Yuchen. Um, uh, uh, I was doing some targeted short-chain fatty acid study, but that's short-chain fatty acid, like not our typical mm -hmm. uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's ways that you can do targeted experiments. Um, I'm not going to get into them right now. Uh, so yeah, this is just our standard positive mode um, analysis. If you want to do something like negative mode, um, high end, yeah. So how about the chart state? Do you tell the machine to do like an, an um, the chart is not decided? Yeah, target. so the instrument will, um, when it does, it's basically, you, when you collect a precursor scan, you'll have, you know, a set of peaks that are all have theoretically have isotopic distributions. Um, the instrument using this uh, advanced precursor determination mm -hmm. uh, feature here, it'll, if it detects a 
isotopic envelope, it'll sign a charge state there. If it can't detect an isotopic envelope, it'll by default set the charge state to one. Oh, okay. That means if the charge is not decided, it will be fragmented, right? Um, if the charge is not decided, basically, um, here's the thing. So with the MIPS node here, basically there needs to be a like isotopic envelope assigned to a precursor before it's sampled. So if you do have this case where the instrument wasn't able to assign a charge state, it won't ever sample that precursor. Oh, okay. Due to this MIPS node. So if you have like a like a singlet just hanging out somewhere in your mass range, it'll be assigned a charge state of one, but it won't be sampled. Okay. So yeah, if you want to do negative mode, the only thing that you need to change for this particular, uh, so this is positive mode. If you want to do negative mode, all you need to do is go down to polarity in your MS1 and change it to negative. On the tribrid, I would recommend never running with both. <laughs> um, what ends up happening is if you select both, um, the charge, the uh, your um, your ionization polarity will flip flop consistently to the point that you never have stable spray, and you'll collect over an hour analysis. This is something that I tested out um, a couple weeks ago. You collect about four thousand spectra over an hour, um, which isn't great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you want to run negative mode, you select negative mode. If you want to do polarity switching, what you would do is you would go up here, this kind of experiment bar. You select actions and you go to add new experiment. And basically you get the second bar here. They're both the same length. Um, you can rename these. So I'm gonna call this first bar MS positive mode. And the second one I'm gonna call MS. If it would let me type. Negative mode. Um, and basically what you would do if you wanted to set up a full polarity switching method is you do the same thing that you did here. And then basically just copy and paste all these nodes and then just set them to negative mode and then have your negative mode exclusion list, mass exclusion list, you know, be for the uh, contaminant ions that you would see in negative mode. Um, I'm not going to do it here just for the sake of time, um, but that's how you would do it. Let me think. What do we want to cover next? There was something that popped in my head, and now I forgot what it was. Ah, that's what it was. So the way that the tribrid kind of optimizes the parallelization, um, if you're doing polarity switching, is kind of interesting. So what happens is the instrument will acquire an MS1, and it'll acquire a second MS1. And then it'll use that first MS1 that it acquired to uh, basically, there's always like a one scan lag time between when it actually starts sampling. So it's not as sequential as a Q exactive might be. And the same thing is seen in negative mode. So basically what happens is you collect a positive mode MS1, a negative mode MS1, and then you collect positive mode MS2s while the negative mode MS1 is collecting. Um, and there's kind of like, again, this one uh, cycle, one scan leg time. So when you're clicking through the raw file, it looks a little weird, but all the information is linked correctly. It's just you know not as linear as you might expect. OK. Uh, Dan, I have a question for, for this one. Uh -huh. uh, so do you observe the same thing if you do ion trap MS2 and orbital yes. MS2? Yep, orbit trap or ion okay. trap MS2s, that pattern remains the same. Um, okay. It's just, you know, how the instrument's been pre-configured to collect data. Mm -hmm. um, you probably scan faster if it did, you know, keep that parallelization, you would have less uh, time. You, you um, When you flip-flop the uh, polarity, the electronics take a little time to settle, so you do have a slight impact to your um, duty cycle. Essentially, you sample less things. Um, so if you wanted to do polarity switching, um, honestly, I would recommend doing orbit trap MS2s as well, because the ion traps take longer to settle because the voltages are higher. It takes longer to flip. So you acquire almost twice as many scans using the orbit trap, 
when you're doing polarity switching on the tribrids compared to using the ion traps for MS2s. So that's another thing that I would want to mention. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, sorry, oh, I'm a little bit confused. You said uh, um, MS2, you choose the HCD, right? For yes. For di director, you use, uh, you can use uh, ion trap for direct detector? Yes, so the ion trap um, you can use for, um, so the ion trap, um, do the way that you, it, sorry. When you use uh, HCD for fragmentation, you use ion trap for direct detector? Uh, yes. For this particular experiment, you can use the orbit trap for the detector as well. It's um, is that a speed? There are a speed difference between. Yeah, so the orbit trap typically, as its rule of slower. thumb, the orbit trap's slower. Yeah, you get higher mass resolution, so it's a cost benefit. Um, we see a booster identification is typically using the ion trap, but on the newest, you know, on the ascend tribrid, um, the orbit trap's much faster, so okay. that difference is smaller. But oh. if you're running on an Eclipse or an IQX, uh, typically speed is the name of the game, from what I've seen, if you're going for depth. OK, okay. Uh, for the MS2, what's the resolution you suggest here? For the MS2s, um, mm -hmm. I would suggest, um, for the Ion Trap, uh, I guess there's not like a resolution. It's more turbo oh, no, rapid. Oh, normal. OK, OK. Um, turbo or rapid are great. Um, typically, lipid spectra are sparse enough that it's not too much of a problem. Um, you don't need to worry about like peaks overlapping. Um, mm -hmm. For the orbit trap, faster is better. So I would use as low of a resolution as it would allow you to. So 15K on an eclipse, oh, 7.5K okay. on the ascent. OK, thank you. And I saw, Fang, you had your uh, hand up. You have a question? Hi, hi, Dan. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very clear. Uh, I noticed that just now when you give the lecture, you give some MS3 method. You have mm -hmm. a selection yeah. criteria, go to PC, PE, in different conditions. Are you going to cover that? Yes, right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so kind of the final portion of this walkthrough, I wanted to, um, <laughs> I wanted to talk about how you can use on the tribrid, um, it has the ability to search your spectral data real time. So I was going to quick in the last 15 minutes or so of this session cover exactly how that's done. And there's a lot of knobs and dials here that you can mess around with. We haven't optimized everything. It's still a work in progress, but this are kind of the, the best rules that we've come up with for lipids that you commonly see in a lot of biological sample types from kind of those fragmentation trees that I talked about in my lecture previously. So. Um, if you want to do real-time library search, the first thing that you um, do is you select it. If it would let me select, and you drop your filter in there. Um, and there's a couple of nested boxes here. So the first thing you need to do is have a configured spectral library. And this is something that I've done beforehand. I'm not going to do right now, but I can pop up a window to show you what it looks like. Let me just open up my spectral library really quick. Um, method building sessions. And I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically I took an MSP library that we built using our uh, lipid search software, LipidX. Um, it generates think, libraries in silico. Yeah. Uh, I think we can't see it. I know I haven't, I haven't shared it yet. I need to oh, open okay. up the... Uh, I'm going to stop sharing for right now. Where are you? I don't know when my, there we go. OK. So I found my libraries. I'm going to plug them in here. And then now I'm going to share my screen again. Share screen, MC fault. Perfect. OK. So this is what the MC Vault library looks like. It's just a SQLite database, really, at the at its core. Um, and what's contained in it 
is basically this in silico library that we previously generated from those fragmentation rules that I kind of derived from um, you know, a variety of sources. You know, uh, some of the libraries entries are from work that Paul Hutchins had done when he originally released the Lipidex software, and he had uh, acquired those in silico spectra or like those uh, in silico fragmentation spectra from authentic standards, um, similar to what I did in my previous lecture. So basically in this library, it's just a list of compounds, addict specific, um, and what's contained in is basically a compound name, a formula, and this kind of compound class. And this compound class is used as like a keyword that uh, I use to basically trigger, like prevent or allow scan specific behavior uh, down the line. And then um, basically there's just spectral information collected alongside this particular entry. So there's the spectrum ID, compound ID, and scan filter aren't really used for anything. You can filter real-time library hits off retention time. I'm not using it in this particular library. Um, but you can see that there's a precursor mass to charge. We don't use the neutral mass. The collision energy is used to um, filter results. So if you have a special library where you have a standard that you, you know, have a variety of energies uh, that you use to activate, you could search against those uh, entries specifically. There's polarity, fragmentation mode, um, ionization mode, a mass analyzer, and instrument that's used. So all this information kind of uh, comes together and you, is used to like intelligently filter exactly what you want to search with to make searches faster. So you're not searching against, you know, negative mode data when you're collecting positive mode and vice versa. So that's what the kind of MZ vault library looks like. So you can figure this, you can uh, create it from a variety of sources. We import it from MSPs uh, that we uh, basically generated in silico um, with some small edits made. Not all the fields populate correctly. So you have to go through and change stuff, but this is what it will look like. Um, okay, I go back to sharing the method editor. Here we are. All right, we're back. So kind of like I said before, you know, pre-configure these libraries. Um, so basically this first library that I entered here is an ion trap specific spectral library. Um, typically there's a lot of, again, knobs and downs you can play with. So like collision energy tolerance. So we use a collision energy of 27. The collision energies are listed as 30 in the library. So, you know, that's within tolerance. So it'll search against all our results. Um, there's a precursor search tolerance that we typically leave at 10. Um, there's a similarity search that you can use. We haven't dabbled with it too much. Um, some of these features are kind of a, on the more experimental side. Um, but similarity search lets you look for specific motifs and it's might be more applicable to like discovering new lipid classes. Um, but again, we haven't explored that too much. So what it'll do is it'll uh, won't look for specific identities. It'll um, like identity search. It'll do similarities searches. So it'll look for like motifs. So if you're looking for a specific ACL chain, it might be able to pull out that data more reliably. But I think it's more applicable to metabolites than lipids. Um, so for addict masses, we typically leave this empty because we've configured our spectral library to be already addict specific. So this way, the um, spectral library searching is done and it'll take the library entries as is. Um, you can specify different addicts such as like um, if you have library entries that are like non-adducted species. So if you just have like PC something and it's not an M plus H, it's not an M plus NA and you have a bunch of library entries that are specific to different addicts, you can then enter like different addicts here and it'll do basically a multi-notch search and I'll calculate neutral masses and then query your entries there. Um, the way that we have our special libraries configured, um, this causes unintended behavior. So we typically don't use it. Um, so this is usually what we leave the settings as. Just take the libraries verbatim. 
the maximum search time we typically leave at 150 milliseconds. You can drop it down. Basically, this is the amount of time that it's live. Uh, it'll take for a spectra to, or a real-time library search to time out. And if it goes past 150 milliseconds, it just doesn't return a result. Typically for lipid data, we don't see this time limit met besides a handful of times per injection, especially if you're using smaller precursor search tolerances. Um, if you have retention time filtered, like specified in your um, library, you can use retention time filters. You can do reverse uh, library searches where you use Basically, instead of doing like a forward dot product, you do a reverse dot product calculation. Or instead of comparing your experimental to your library, you compare your library to your experimental. It can have certain benefits. We don't use it. Um, you can also search for multiple precursors. If you have co-isolated species, the instrument can figure that out. Um, again, haven't optimized a ton there. Um, just because there's a lot of other settings here. I'm going to kind of speed through them. So uh, really the only thing under peak selection and threshold settings we use, we use as a trigger only. We don't add addicts to dynamic exclusion, and we don't add match fragments to dynamic exclusion. Um, basically, those are things that you can do to, you know, match fragments to dynamic exclusion can help reduce the sampling of in-source fragments in theory. Um, we haven't seen much benefit to it as of yet, but it needs more testing. Um, our scoring thresholds we set uh, to cosine score, which is basically like a spectral similarity score. Um, and for PC species, we typically set to at least 90 um, PC spectral matches trend tend to be 90 plus almost ubiquitously because you're really only matching that 184 ion. Um, so this is what we use for PCs. And then the kind of final step <laughs> and this is a little counterintuitive, is to do this branched method, which I'll just drag over really quick. Um, come on, do it. Let me do it. Oh, come on. What it's supposed to do is you put a real-time library search node on top of each of these MSN. There we go. So this is where we can build out that decision tree that I've discussed previously. Now, if it stop being a pain in my keister, just let me, come on. Why are you doing this to me? There we go, perfect. So now theoretically, we have each branch specific for each kind of like fragmentation tree that we want to profile, kind of like what I discussed previously. So we could use this first one, or this, uh, yeah, this first one to um, target PCs, say. So we'll just quickly repopulate all this information from what I discussed. So we set the cosine score to 90 for PCs. And then there's this compound class field. So the way that real-time library search works is basically any spectral match that passes the score threshold here could theoretically trigger downstream scans, um, downstream behavior. That's broken. There we go. So to prevent each of these branches from triggering each time you identify something at like, you know, a cosine score of 90, you can leverage 
this compound class feature to basically reject every compound class besides the one that you want to target on. There's two options when you add these kind of compound class filters. There's promote and reject. And it doesn't behave in the way that you would like it to. Basically, you always want to reject everything besides, in this case, PCs. Um, so you basically need to look at your spectral library, figure out all the classes that you have, and then write reject next to it. Uh, it's a huge pain to do by hand, so I've done it manually already, or beforehand. So basically, there's this CSV that I can import. It basically says, anytime you have a special high scoring special match that belongs to an acyl carnitine here, don't trigger. And if you go through the entire list, basically you don't trigger on everything besides PCs. It's the way that it works. <laughs> it's a little frustrating, but. Um, and then finally, you know, once you configure that, you can set your final leg of your MSN tree to what you need it to. So if this is for PCs, basically you want to do a CID MS2 from kind of what I described previously. So. We'll go ahead and do that. Kind of using similar settings to this HCDMS2, we'll just change activation type to CID. And then basically mimic all the other settings. So we want to flick, fix collision energy. I've been using CID collision energies of 35%. That's what I've seen. Gives me the best results for collecting this MSN data. Um, but you know, again, there's some optimization that could be done depending on your lipid species. And then everything else looks pretty good. Um, so that's how we would characterize using the kind of MS entry logic and real-time live research PCs. We do sphinx myelins in the second tree, second branch. Once again, we're kind of importing in that, uh, um, that base spectral library. And using many of the same settings, keep going down, add academic exclusion. We want confidence score to be at least 90, or cosine score to be at least 90 again. And then here, um, basically, you have this list. And Sphingham Islands aren't included in this. PCs are. So you're only triggering this branch on just Sphingham Islands. So precursor matches Fingham Islands, and you have a choline fragment ion in your MS2. So then to continue on kind of like this, that decision tree, we want to do that second CID MS2. Zero point seven CID thirty five percent. Everything else looks okay. And then we do a second round of searching. So this is where, you know, for Sphingham Island example, or basically after you do a CAD MS2, what you would hope to see if this is actually Sphingham Island is a water loss and two peaks corresponding to head group neutral losses. So I have another spectral library that's specific just for Sphingham Island species that contains the spectral matches. So you do a second round search on that. And this time we'll be a little more permissive. We'll use a spectral similarity score of at least 60 instead of 90, because we're matching, we're looking for three kind of peaks matching instead of just 184. And we don't need to use this compound class uh, filter this time, since only Sphingham Islands already made it through this first filter. We don't need to do it for the second filter. And then finally, you do your uh, CID MS3 off that neutral loss peak. So you want an MS3, and then you basically we leave these MS1 and MS2 isolation windows as is at 2.5 and 2. And we set an isolation offset. To negative 57.079. I believe that's the number. Basically, that's a way that you can force the instrument 
if you get the spectral match that's high enough quality it'll go grab the right peak using this offset otherwise it'll sample that water loss peak by default and you don't get any additional information um so it's just kind of like a hard-coded rule that helps us get the right uh fragment re-isolated for MS3 activation. So you can actually get that structural information. And there's some that we manually did uh, using standards to figure out kind of those behaviors. And then once again, ion trap, rapid, you know, high AGC targets, fast scans. And then we change this from number of scans to scans per outcome, and we just leave it at one. Any questions so far? It looks like I ran a little long. The last branch, we basically do the same thing um, using the same spectral library. We're just targeting uh, glycerophospholipids this time. So it'd be PIs, PEs, PSs, PGs, um, using the same library. It's already defined. Um, it's just similar to before, like all the other examples. Um, cosine score, in this case, we're going to leave it at 60 instead of 90. We really only use 90 for choline containing lipids. And then our compound class reject list is going to be this PG, like uh, basically reject everything besides PIs, PEs, PSs, and PGs. Um, and that's basically the real time library search <laughs> workflow for these five different lipid or six different lipid classes. Um, so again, these rules aren't like the end all be all. There's other lipid classes that you could apply this to. You could take a look at when you think lipid individual lipid species are not characterized to the degree that they could be. Um, you just need to derive those rules yourself. So, you know, you could apply RTLS strategies to negative mode as well. It's something that we haven't done yet. We just focused on positive mode. But um, yeah, lots of opportunity here. Lots of exciting stuff to do. All right. Thing. Hi, hi, Dan. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, I realize uh, the library is very important in this method. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I uh, was wondering, uh, are you able to share the template, how you build the library? If the library is not sharing with us, but mm -hmm. if you have some template of that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah. in regards to like the um the library that's kind of entered here or like the in silico library that we generate with lipid x yeah both. yeah so one thing i'll say is um i'm putting out these libraries with when this paper comes out um we're so resubmitting it hopefully the last time it should be the last time um in a week or so um so hopefully it'll uh, okay to be out but there is a um yeah remind me to reach out to you. I have, I made the data repository already public on pride. Uh -huh. So you uh -huh. should be able to pull these libraries from there okay. at this point. Um, I'm also more than happy to put these libraries in the Google drive that I think was shared with you. Um, I'll just need to talk with uh, Laura Vantol um, to figure out how to get access no, to that. But no, yeah, that, that, no that's no worry about it. We, uh, yeah, as long as you, you submit this this paper, so we're just waiting for your paper being published to can find it over there. Mm -hmm. That's that's going to be the worry you have for. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a second question is not quite related. Uh, when you do the lipidomics, uh, are you, uh, do you have any study about uh, the ganglicide? Uh, I haven't worked with ganglicides myself, but it's an active area of, you know, uh, basically, um, we there was a really nice paper um it was do you remember vanessa's uh lipid genie paper you chen was that in cell systems that's probably in nature metabolism nature metabolism um but basically w there was some ganglioside work done there with genetically d uh diverse outbred mice um we've also been working with standards to kind of try to expand our uh, ganglioside library as well um Library work is honestly the uh, crux of the, a lot of this, you know, a lot of the matters like, you know, you don't have, you want to derive all these fragmentation rules, but your the libraries that you can easily get aren't always as good as you want, which is why for like the development of these like uh, 
the MZ Vault libraries that I have here, I basically sat down with deuterated standards and rederived the fragmentation rules myself for the energies that I wanted to use, just so that I could be as selective as I possibly could be. Um, and hopefully other people find that useful as well. <laughs> and Gunga said is uh, definitely kind of interesting uh, libraries we're looking at right now. Yeah. And uh, that's also kind of uh, one of the libid classes where when you will see plus twos or uh, like minus two charge mm -hmm. states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The multiple charges on Gunga said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>